Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. In every conflict, American technology has proved its worth. And in every age, American warfighters have proved themselves capable of using that technology to its best advantage. At no time has that been more true than in the era of the F-8 Crusader, the last gunfighter aircraft, which today we have one of these remarkable warfighters who flew that aircraft in combat. Ladies and gentlemen, highly decorated American fighter pilot, recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross, and F-8 Crusader expert, USMC Captain James Markle. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see a good crowd here today. Uh, I'm especially thankful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, this museum does so much in preserving our aviation heritage, uh, both civil and military, and I'm really honored to be asked to uh, speak today. And I see uh, some of the guests that we, invo we invited are here. Welcome. Uh, and uh, I saw Santosh Kumar, there he is. Uh, he introduced me to uh, Cindy, and Cindy was kind enough to invite me to come out. So I'm honored to be here with you, supporting the Western Museum of Flight uh, in uh, presenting our aviation, her preserving our aviation heritage. Uh, special thanks to Director Maka, Bruce Cooperman, who is uh, the videographer today and does all the work uh, getting the, uh, had amazing, amazing patience teaching me the right buttons on the museum's equipment. And behind the scenes, the amazing member volunteers that make the whole museum work. We're going to talk today about the F-8 Crusader, which not surprisingly was my favorite airplane and one I was lucky enough to accumulate a thousand hours in. Uh, that's fairly rare for a fighter pilot to get a thousand hours in one type, but I was able to do that. And I hope to convey to you the unique characteristics of this amazing airplane and also some insights into the people who flew this terrific machine. That's the right flyer. It flew in 1903. We're going to talk about an airplane today that first flew in 1955. Not very many years, but the advances are tremendous. You'll notice on the right flyer that the uh, pitch control was handled by those forward control surfaces that we call canards on other airplanes. And uh, the, uh, the Wright brothers actually agreed that putting pitch control in the aft end of the airplane would contribute to stability. But when they filed their initial patent application, they had the forward uh, pitch control surfaces, and someone else in the meantime patented the aft pitch control surfaces. Uh, but we went from the right flyer to the Bell X-1. And Bell X-1 was strictly an experimental airplane built for the sole purpose of breaking the sound barrier. That was a real challenge, and there were many lives lost and many airplanes lost attempting uh, to go, go the speed of sound and sustain it. One of the reasons was as the airplane accelerates through the air, as that airflow goes supersonic, if it finds a hinge point on the airplane, it will set up a flutter. And that's what happened on airplanes with a conventional elevator for pitch control. And that flutter would become increasingly uh, large amplitude and eventually uh, destroy the tail section of the airplane. So it was a, uh, considered a very uh, hazardous pursuit. The, uh, on a parallel track, the chief test pilot for um, Bell, a couple days before the flight, decided to demand a $100,000 bonus to get in this machine to go supersonic. So the next day they convened a, a uh, meeting at uh, Muroc Dry Lake, which is now Edwards Air Force Base, of uh, the commanding general of the base, uh, some senior Bell officials, and uh, they discussed 
how they were going to get this flight off without having to go to Congress for an emergency appropriation of 100,000, which probably would have been hard to come by. The uh, general who was in charge of the base, I love this quote, stood up and he said, I've got this captain out there. We pay him 400 bucks a month and he'll do it. And that uh, captain was Chuck Yeager. It was then the Army Air Corps. And uh, it's on the right of your screen. Uh, I came to know Chuck uh, while we served on a, on a community bank advisory board in Napa when we lived up there, when I lived up there, Bev and I lived up there. And uh, he's uh, kind of a curmudgeon, and some of you may have seen him exhibit those characteristics in his public speaking. It turned out uh, I never had too much to say, I just listened, and uh, we got along great. <laughs> he, uh, he was uh, really a very interesting fellow, and in most cases he was uh, completely right about things. Well, fast forward to Dallas, Texas. In 1952, the U.S. Navy wrote a request for proposal to uh, have a supersonic fighter that could sustain supersonic speeds over a great distance and at the same time be capable of getting slow enough to land on an aircraft carrier. Uh, Vought engineers went to work in Dallas, Texas, and here they are. They built the prototype. And in this uh, video, they're dismantling it for shipment to Muroc Dry Lake, which is now Edwards Air Force Base. And here's the airplane in Muroc. One unusual feature that it had was a variable incidence wing. And you know, the wing does the flying. So what it did for the Crusader, when you raised the wing, it lowered the fuselage so the pilot could see the deck. Um, and they also did some pretty, well, for its day, some pretty sophisticated aerodynamic uh, uh, modifications. And here's the uh, prototype Crusader on its first flight from the dry lake. And incidentally, on that very first flight flown by uh, Voss chief test pilot John Conrad, uh, the airplane went supersonic, which I believe was a, was a record. Uh, here's some in-flight shots on that first flight. And then here he is coming back in for a landing. And that's an F-100. It was so much slower, it was late to go flying over. <laughs> the airplane uh, eventually flown by a Navy commander by the name of uh, Robert Windsor, uh, flew a production airplane and exceeded 1,000 miles an hour on a closed course out of Patuxent, Maryland, where the Naval Air Test Center was and is today. And uh, Vaught immediately seized on the opportunity and created the 1,000 mile an hour club. And that picture is of a lapel pin that I still have that was presented to me in 1964 when I took a Crusader on one of my familiarization flights and went out past Catalina Island and headed south. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the Pacific Missile Range can see all that airspace. They tracked us on radar. And the uh, controller called up and said, uh, you're doing 1,337 uh, no, 1,037 1, miles per hour. So when I landed back at El Toro, uh, the chance fought rep met me at the airplane and presented me with that pin, and I still have it today. This is, uh, I want to do a little shout out to a really good guy who I had hoped could be here with us today. His name is Steve Folger. Uh, he was a senior captain in the first squadron I checked into, and I got the pleasure of having him chased me on my familiarization flights. The F-8 was a single seat airplane, so your first flight was a solo. Uh, they wouldn't let us use the afterburner on the first couple of flights because you had to get the gear up and the wing down by 220 knots. And in basic engine, it was accelerating pretty rapidly in afterburner. It'd take you a little experience before you could catch up with it. But in any event, when I sat down for a briefing with Steve, He's just a wonderful guy. And, I, and one of the pilots in the squadron said, oh, you're so lucky to get Steve uh, to chase you on this uh, flight. 
He said, he's just the smoothest guy in the world. He said, you can be on his wing while he's doing air combat maneuvering, which is usually pretty violent. And he is so smooth, you'll think you're flying parade on the Blue Angels. But uh, so one thing, in the briefing, Steve opened up the manual and took this diagram of boarding the airplane. Now, whether you buy a Yugo or a Maserati or a Chevy or whatever, you get an owner's manual with it, right? And it tells you a lot of things about that vehicle, but it doesn't tell you how to get in and out. They assume that's somewhat instinctive. But with the F-8, it was important uh, because Navy aircraft carrier commanders do not like a lot of loose items on the deck because you've got the hazards of uh, jet blast, a moving deck, and they can become quite hazardous. So the Crusader had a built-in boarding system of steps and ladders that you could get up to the edge of the canopy, which was 10 or 12 feet off the ground. And, uh, but it did take a little bit of smarts. Steve in the briefing said, when you get up to the canopy, if the pointy end is behind you, climb down and start over. So, because if you didn't start off on the right foot, which happened to be the left foot, by the way, you had to start on the left foot so that when you arrived at the canopy, you could step into the cockpit. Steve would be with us. He's 86. He's a retired uh, full bird colonel in the Marine Corps, put 30 years in, and then went to work for Northrop afterward. I, so some of you may have known him. Uh, but a, a wonderful guy and a, and a terrific pilot. It's amazing. This is a photo version of the Crusader, and you can tell that by the windows on the side. No guns, no uh, guns, uh, barrels coming out of the nose. And uh, the, you notice that the fuselage is a little bit more squared off. They got a little bit more fuel in the airplane. And uh, this is a picture of an airplane that John Glenn flew on a transcontinental speed record in uh, 1950. Seven, I believe it was. He flew uh, from coast to coast. Uh, they couldn't get the Air Force to provide a KC-135 to do the refueling, so they used a Navy AJ. Do you folks know what that is? It's a Douglas twin-engine, piston-engine bomber that to get it to go a little bit faster, they put a jet engine in the tail. It didn't last too long in service, but it was the refueling airplane for John Glenn's record flight that he made that trip from Los Alamitos out here to Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, New York, three hours, 23 minutes, and 8.4 seconds. That included the time to slow down because his tanker obviously couldn't fly at the same speed. Um, and here he is after the flight. Now one very unusual feature was this variable incidence wing. And I'd like to show you it in operation. A lot of moving parts. The entire leading edge droops down. The ailerons droop down. And the flaps lower. So it adds a lot of camber to the wing so they can get it much, much slower for a carrier approach. And more importantly, it lowers the nose, nose of the fuselage so the pilot can see the deck, which is important. This. Uh, I was trying to find a picture of the F-8 in uh, Burner, and uh, I uh, recall one of the uh, first realizations that I was lucky enough to get the right woman to be my wife was when, uh, after we were married, I was still in the Marine Corps, and I was an instructor at a Navy base in, uh, in Brunswick, Georgia, and we would night fly on Tuesday nights. And so this is about four weeks after we're married, we're back in Brunswick, Georgia, I'm back at work. And so on Tuesday night, I go out to night fly. And uh, I would always night qualify in the Crusader. They had a number of them there, early serial numbers. And Bev would drive out to the airport and park at the end of the runway because when it was truly dark, that would throw a flame about 40 feet behind the airplane. <laughs> Quite spectacular, so. And I also have to mention uh, today's the 16th, so in uh, six days, Bev and I are going to celebrate 55 years of marriage.
Congratulations to her for putting up with me for all these years. And honey, every day's a holiday, every meal's a banquet, you know that. <laughs> uh, this is a great picture that uh, Bruce Guggerman uh, found for me. Uh, I want to point out something where if you look through the area where the wing is raised, you can see the actuator. Do you see the rod, the vertical rod there? That's about a three-quarter inch diameter, and that's the entire structure that holds the front of that wing on the airplane. We often wondered about that, but I guess as long as there's positive G on the airplane or it's locked, it works out okay. And then uh, Bush, uh, Bruce was kind enough to put uh, an arrow there that points out the ventral fins. Those uh, uh, came about on the third iteration of the F-8 uh, to straighten out the airflow. The airplane had a tendency to spin, and those spins were largely irrecoverable. So we lost a lot of airplanes in the early days from, uh, from spins, and the uh, ventral fins as pointed out here, it did help that a lot. Now, after being at El Toro, living on Lido Island, driving a Corvette back and forth to work, and flying five days a week in this terrific machinery, I got a little culture shock. First of all, I had just met Bev. We had three dates, and off I went to Southeast Asia. And it turned out, it was supposed to be a 13-month tour, but the Marine Corps counting systems aren't always accurate. It was actually 14 months that I was on. And th to show you how primitive the area was, this was our squadron uh, area. The runway, of course, was, and the taxiways in the parking area were paved, but everything else was that reddish uh, mud color. Bev had asked me when we left if I had a picture that I could send her, and I didn't have one. Uh, but when I first arrived in Vietnam, I was temporarily billeted in some old French barracks at the Da Nang airfield. And um, while there, I ran into a, a fellow by the name of George Wastela. He was an infantry officer, and he was waiting for assignment to a battalion as a, uh, as a platoon commander. And uh, he and I decided that we'd go downtown for dinner, which you could still do at that time. So we got, made arrangements uh, for a Vietnamese taxi cab to come out and pick us up. And they took us to Terrain, which is the town adjacent uh, to, to Da Nang, and we had a delightful uh, meal at an outdoor French restaurant. But right next door, there was a photo shop, and it said in the window, open 24 hours. I couldn't figure out why. But I, I said, George, excuse me for a minute. I, I walked over there, and I said, could you take a picture? And I said, oh, yes, yeah, sure, of course. So they took this picture. So this is literally a day or two after I arrived in and, uh, and you saw, it. and I'm proud to say Bev still has this picture on her desk at home. So Now, you can contrast that to this picture. This is exactly one year later. So the first picture was in September of 65. This is September of 66. And um, I remember this. It was about 3 a.m. I had just returned from a mission that was referred to as a night special. Um, and I'm sitting in a chair with a 40-yard stare, and you can see the bandolier from my shoulder holster. Uh, our weapon, assigned weapon, was a 38 police special, which when I was with the grunts told me, who are you going to hurt with that thing? <laughs> but the reason was, and you may be able to tell from the bandolier over my shoulder, uh, those are all tracer rounds. And the revolver wasn't really for defense, it was a signaling device. We always used to joke that if the helicopters didn't come in to pick us up, we could shoot them down. But, uh, <laughs> and of course, uh, you can always tell a fighter pilot, but you can't tell them much. Uh, however, I will say this. The people that I worked with, officers enlisted, were just terrific. I made some great long-term friendships, and the fact that they, the maintainers, could keep all that gear working under those primitive conditions, airplanes outside, blowing sand, uh, you know, 100 degrees in the summer and 99% humidity. But uh, really, the Marine Corps showed its best. Uh, I was uh, an enlisted Marine, 
So I was a Mustang, got selected for flight training, and I remember going through boot camp at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego. And uh, those of you that have been there, it's got some beautiful Spanish architecture buildings. And there was one passageway that we would go through where over the archway, it said, do the right thing in the right way for the right reason. And that kind of became my byword. I, that was true and most, now we weren't perfect. Uh, there were a few Marines that maybe didn't quite measure up. You know, Lee Harvey Oswald was a Marine, so we don't uh, say they were all perfect, but they were really a pretty good group of people in, in home. I also wanted to show you a little bit of ingenuity. I know this is difficult to see, it's not a very good picture, but I wanted a, a picture of the stick grip that was in uh, the airplanes that I flew. And uh, if you know, the pilot's hand would be coming in kind of from the right hand side. And I'll point out to you that uh, underneath uh, the front of the, is a trigger and that fired the guns and, the, uh, and uh, some of the other ordnance that was on. The button on the left hand side was the primary release. You had a master armament panel where you would select uh, what you were going to fire or drop, and uh, this button would release any bombs that were under the wing. Then this button on the front was always there, but the engineers ran out of places to put activation buttons for some of the ordnance. So this button on the forward part of the stick, which you would reach around and hit with your, your uh, ring, ring or little finger, on the ground would engage and disengage the nose of steering. And when you were airborne, it fired the Zuni rockets. Now what could go wrong? I mean, <laughs> actually, we never had anything go wrong. It was pretty amazing. This is the USS Hancock. And uh, I was always fascinated by aircraft carrier operations. And I qualified uh, twice uh, going through training. And incidentally, I still look back on uh, the Naval Air Training Command as one of the uh, greatest creations of mankind. I went for 18 months. I came out, I had uh, 300 hours in my logbook, logbooks, and I had landed on two different carriers, qualified in both piston and swept wing jets, uh, had fired guns, had dropped bombs, had gone supersonic. The last part of my advanced jet training was in the F-11, the Grumman F-11. You may remember that, the Blue Angels flew it for many years, a great, great airplane. But I thought this picture of the Hancock, excuse me, the Hancock showed how crowded uh, those early aircraft carriers are. I mean, look at all those airplanes. And obviously what they're doing is they're respotting for a launch. So they've got to figure out which ones you take down below, what ordnance you put on what airplanes, and then you get them back up in a position where they can be launched and recovered. You can see that the forward elevator on the deck is open. And then if you look to the, uh, what would be to your right, there's a side elevator that also goes to the hangar deck with an A4 on it. And then I thought it was interesting to note, if you look toward the island, the this, this structure, uh, you'll see uh, the first large airplane is a Grumman S2F. And those were anti-submarine type patrol airplanes. And then later they were developed to do a lot of electronic warfare type activity. If you look right behind that, you'll see two more Grumman S2Fs with a huge radome on top stuck on top. And so the nickname for the S2F was the Stoof, and the one with the radome on top was a Stoof with a roof. These are some launches and takeoffs, and you can kind of get an idea. That airplane is going from zero to about 140 knots in about 250 feet. And you notice how firm the landing is. On an aircraft carrier approach in a swept wing jet, you maintain a constant attitude and you fly it all the way down to the deck. So typically a touchdown was about four times the force of gravity. It's amazing the avionics ever worked with that kind of treatment, seriously. Now, 
it was a challenge uh, bringing the airplane aboard a carrier, and especially in a high performance airplane like the F-8. Uh, even though that sophisticated wing you get it slowed down, you were still somewhere around uh, 160 miles an hour approaching the back of the ship. Uh, and for people that think in knots, that's about 135 knots. But uh, here's a couple of mishaps. This one is uh, a crusader that is taking the barrier. And that's something that they would rig if the tail hook wasn't going to work. And that happened frequently. Um, I don't know if you've heard of lightning holes, but that was a concept that if you could get the airplane lighter, then it wouldn't take quite so much catapult to get it airborne, and you could fly it a little slower to land. So lightning holes were where a maintainer would go out with a drill and find a piece of structure that was bigger than he thought it needed to be. And so he'd drill a bunch of lightning holes, L-I-G-H-T-E-N-I-N-G, to lighten the structure. The problem is sometimes they got a little bit carried away, and in a couple of instances, on the first attempt, the tail hook was pulled out of its mounting place because it had too many lightning holes in it. It wasn't enough to hold the airplane. You can imagine that this airplane going 160 miles an hour, it's going to come to a stop at about 200 feet. So it's a pretty significant arrestment. Um, and a couple of things that I remember uh, that my first time, which was in a, a piston powered airplane, a, a T 28C, which was a T 28 that had a 1400 horsepower engine and a tail hook. And he's briefing me. Now, your instructor never brought out to the carrier with you. I don't know if that was a lack of faith or not, but you went solo. And uh, he said, Whatever you do, he said, I know you'll do the checklist, you'll get the gear down, the hook down, and everything else. You know, if there's a placard up on the instrument panel in case you forget. <laughs> but whatever you do, make sure that you lock the shoulder harness. If you don't, you'll be wearing the implant of a gun sight on your forehead for life. So <laughs> I always remember to lie. So let's take a look at this guy coming into the barricade. It did okay. Now this one, he gets way low, hits the ramp. Here comes the landing gear. And this is uh, taken, it's called a plat tape, pilot landing assisted television. Now, you can see the parachute in the water in that last uh, cut there, so. The F-8 was uh, quite successful as a fighter uh, in the MiG environment, particularly early in the conflict before uh, the F-4s and uh, other airplanes got there. Uh, there were 22 engagements involving MiGs and F-8s. Uh, the, uh, Crusader was victorious in 19 of them against three losses. And you think about that ratio, 19 to three, I think it was the best of any airplane in uh, aerial combat. This also, uh, this is from an early, well, I need to tell you the story about, when the F-8 went out of the fleet in 1987, they held a party at the then Naval Air Station Miramar. I say then because now, it's a Marine Corps air station. I still have not figured out how the Marines talked the Navy into giving up dinner in La Jolla for the deserts of uh, Fallon, Nevada, which is where they moved to. But that's a Marine Corps air station now. And uh, they had a big party in 1987. 3,000 people showed up to Miramar. And they called it the uh, Last Crusader Ball. Such a good time was had that some uh, Navy guys who were going to retire in the San Diego area decided to continue the tradition. So last fall, I went to the 31st last annual Crusader Ball. <laughs> and we still get pretty good attendance and uh, met some very interesting people, including uh, Bev and I had dinner with a guy who was uh, on Guadalcanal flying, somebody can help me here, F-4Fs uh, in 1942 when it, you know, the outcome was not clearly 
determined at that point. Nicest man, his son brought him and helped him, and we actually saw him twice uh, there. He also was shot down by a zero from Guadalcanal, and when they sent him back to the States, he went to the Naval Air Test Center, and he was uh, doing carrier suitability testing on the F-8, and had the first ejection from an F-8. So he had, but he was just a, the nicest gentleman. The F-8 had refueling capability. The probe was on the left-hand side of the airplane behind a fitting, and uh, it was a little bit of a challenge, and I'll show you why. Here's an A-4, which has what's called a buddy store, which is a tank and a hose and a drogue. Look where the pilot's head is. That probe is behind his head. And those of you that have done some formation flying know that you cannot look off in that direction because you will inadvertently turn the airplane left. So there it is, he's unplugging. And then I like this one because it's, the Navy is unplugging and they're doing their retraction of the refueling probe and formation. So they both close at the same time. I wanted to include a little bit about some of the people I flew with because those are very interesting stories. Uh, this group from left, uh, from your left to right, gentleman on the left is uh, Rainer Revis, son of a Baptist minister in Waco, Texas, uh, Baylor graduate. Uh, also, he was a yell leader, which as soon as the guys in the squadron found out, they kept asking him where he kept his pom-poms. <laughs> but a great guy, and uh, he, uh, he went on, sadly lost his wife about gosh, 10 years ago. Yeah, and, uh, uh, but he went and he uh, retired at that time to be with her. And, uh, but he was a senior vice president of Gulfstream Aerospace, who makes the larger business jets, and also an officer of uh, General Dynamics. And so we were in two squadrons in the Marine Corps, stayed in touch, and we did quite a bit of business. Uh, uh, I, uh, for a while, uh, actually uh, resold Gulfstream's uh, trade in inventory for them. And that's me next to him. The gentleman to my left, to a second from the right, is Bill Ridings, known as the Eagle. Now, not the E-A-G-L-E, -E, but the I-G-G-L-E. He uh, adopted that nickname, and you can't quite tell it from that picture, but he had a shaved head, uh, Romanesque nose, and he could uh, strike a pose <laughs> with his arms up, and he looked like an eagle. Uh, but he also was a very, very colorful guy. And uh, one of the stories that preceded him, the squadron he was in transitioned to F-8s from FJs. And an FJ is the Navy version of that F-86 over there. I don't know if you knew that. It had tail hook, and uh, the Navy flew it not, for not too long, but maybe 10 years. In any event, uh, the Eagle, there's never a problem you can't solve. He's out on a flight, and they come back to Beaufort to land, and when the leader puts his landing gear handle down, the left main gear doesn't come down. So the Eagle says, well, just circle the field and I'll come up and take a look. Now, they're down at Patter down, they're at 1,000 feet. What would the first thing you think you'd do? Maybe go up to 10 or 50, <laughs> but they don't do that. Eagle t gets underneath and looks up in there and he can see that the uplock has not released the landing gear on that side. So he says, he looks at his wing and he looks at the uh, wheel well and he says, you know, I think I can fix that. So he slides his airplane in a skid underneath and sticks his wing tip in the wheel well and as he does that, uh, and I want to go check it out, but uh, apparently the opening going into the gear well of an FJ or an F-86 is about the same width as the wing on, <laughs> on a matching airplane. They stick together. Now, they're at a thousand feet, that's not, and they start rolling, stuck together with the wing in the, uh, in the gear well. Fortunately, passing about 500 feet, 
as the Edel said, it's like a boy killing snakes in there. Everybody's trying everything to break apart. And they did break apart, recovered. The leaders left landing gear, came down, and they landed successfully. And so Bill always tells the story as being a hero, which I think he was, but still. Oh, and the gentleman on the far right is uh, the late Willie Alvord, and he was a free spirit and sadly passed away, gosh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, on the day that he decided he needed to get in shape. And he got on his jogging clothes and made it to the end of his driveway before he keeled over from a massive heart attack and passed away. But uh, he had his own set of rules, and his most famous quote was, better dead than look bad. So he, he always tried to be the guy that was just a little bit closer in the formation that would pull just a few more Gs in the landing pattern. And uh, one day he was out on a mission, and he had a 19-shot rocket pack underneath one wing. There is a circular barrel-shaped uh, unit that wouldn't fire. So he comes back to the airport, and the procedure was if you had hung ordnance, something that you couldn't drop, uh, that you were to make a straight-in approach for the following reason. Willie decides that, no, he's going to come into the break doing 500 knots and pull about six Gs. Well, he did, but unfortunately, it pulled the rocket pack off the wing, and it fell down to the airport, but not before it passed through the wing of an Army transport plane. So <laughs> he got in a little trouble on that one. But anyway, he was a wonderful guy, and we, we, he left us far too early. This is the last annual Crusader Ball last October. And the gentleman on the left is Rich Kiefer, and I got to know him, we became very good friends. He ran uh, the annual reunion uh, some years back when it was held in San Francisco, and he asked me to be on his committee, and we had a great time. The gentleman on the far right is John Doherty, and John is uh, Bevel Bear Me Out. He is one of the funniest people you'll ever meet in your life. He starts telling you a story, and you know when he starts giggling that it's going to be a good one. And they are. They're all great, and they're all unique. But John had, uh, I investigated his accident. I was a safety officer that squatted toward the end of my tour. And uh, this is the result. John is number two in a flight of three. And I don't want to say that, I mean, I took an oath, so I just Yes, sir, three bags full and followed my orders. But there were some orders that were a little bit questionable, and one of them was overloading the airplanes. Um, I was able, in the course of the investigation, uh, get a chart from the tire manufacturer that showed what the maximum allowable tire speed was, which was 165 knots on the ground. The ordnance load these guys had that day required them to rotate at 175. So they're 10 knots over the maximum tire speed limit. And uh, I'm a big believer. If there's a limit in there, that's probably, you don't want to go any further. So John is number two. The uh, commanding officer of the squadron is number one. And to get interval on takeoff, we used what we call a burner light interval. In other words, Everybody would run up to full power, check the gauges, give the leader a thumbs up. He would release brakes, start the roll. As, as it started the roll, he would select the afterburner. And when the next airplane saw that afterburner light, it gave him about five to 700 feet of uh, interval. And so he would begin his roll, uh, roll and complete it. Well, the skipper gets down to, uh, gets about rotate speed and blows a tire. So he puts the hook down, calls the tower, and steers to the middle of the runway because there's a resting gear on the runway. Uh, very difficult to stop an airplane with a blown tire, a crusader with a blown tire. Uh, John, who is number two, is doing just fine up until the carcass blown off the tire goes down the inlet of his airplane. So 
the airplane starts compressor stalling, making a lot of noise. Uh, fortunately, John, as you saw in that picture, he was pretty trim then, and he was probably even more trim in that day and age. So he has nowhere to go because the skipper's in the gear in the middle of the runway. So he reefs the airplane off, gets enough of an arc to go over the top, and when he reaches the top, he ejects. Now, the limit on the Martin Baker seats that we had in those days, they had no rocket assist. It was just basically a howitzer shell, and it would kick you up high enough to clear the tail, but it didn't give you any additional vertical uh, guidance. So John ejects. The airplane crashes off the end of the runway, and I mentioned the 2,000-pound bomb. There were two on board. And we'd had a briefing by ordnance people that said, well, if, if you don't command it when you drop it, th those bombs won't explode. Well, there was a little flaw in that theory. John's airplane crashes off the end of the runway. One of the 2,000-pound bombs breaks open and goes off in a low-order explosion from the fire from the wreckage. You know, uh, burns the powder off. The other one, which and was supposed to present, prevent this, is the fusing on those bombs was, had a little propeller on the front of the bomb. And it had a heavy-duty copper wire that would come down from the bomb rack and go through a hole in the shaft of that pro propeller. So until you dropped it, the propeller wouldn't turn and arm the bomb. Well, John never dropped it. Uh, as near as we can tell, I mean, there wasn't much left of that part of the airplane. But the second bomb went off in a high order explosion. Now, a 2,000 pound bomb is a considerable piece of weaponry. I mean, if you see them dropped in the field, you'll see the swamp grass in a rice paddy half a mile away being beaten down by the concussion. So by the time that goes off, John lands and starts to walk away, because he's pretty close to the wreckage, and the uh, 20 millimeter rounds are starting to cook off. So there's a lot of stuff flying around. That bomb goes off. Now, by the grace of God, how he avoided being hit by all the shrapnel that generated, I'll never know. The concussion knocked him down. That's how close he was. He said that was kind of fortunate, because then a lot of it went over the top of him. He got up to re resume his walk to the perimeter road that went around the airport and fell down because he failed to release his parachute and snagged on a tree behind him. <laughs> so he, he gets that undone and he gets to the perimeter road and there just happens to be an Air Force Jeep coming around the perimeter road, which he flags down. Now at Da Nang, the Marines were on one side and the Air Force was on the other side of the runway. I never quite figured out this funding puzzle. We were living in tents and the Air Force had air-conditioned barracks and a cook your own steak in the bar. <laughs> but anyway, so John decides, well, they have a lot nicer club than we do. So he has them take him over to the Air Force Club, which was called the Doom Club, D-O-O-M, the Da Nang Officers Open Mess. We had, were aware that something had happened because we saw all the explosions. No one saw a parachute. We thought John was a goner. I mean, we thought he was in the airplane. Uh, make a long story short, he gets over to the bar, cannot buy a drink, and we didn't recover him till about 11 o'clock that night. And he was, as they say, knee walking and, and got him back. But he was totally uninjured. I mean, he had a couple of scrapes and but, uh, amazing story. And uh, one of these days, I'd love to invite him down here. He is the best storyteller. Let me see. There's not too many of us that are my age that remember Pogo, the comic strip. But you remember the alligator, and he sometimes had an army uniform and a helmet on. And one of the, my favorite cartoons, is he said, he's standing there with his helmet on, and he says, 
we have met the enemy and he is us and there's a lot of truth to that I uh, to protect the museum I wanted to make sure I had permission to use it and so uh, uh, Bruce was kind enough to get me uh, who to write I did I sent an email that weekend Monday morning bright and early guy called me and uh, the, the the author's name was Walt Kelly and he said this is Pete Kelly and we got your email and it's fine if you use the quote you just can't use the cartoon itself so we said okay that'd be great so we took them up on their gracious offer and um, the reason I want to mention that is uh, uh, 98 percent of the people I dealt with the Marine Corps were really good people great values uh, great performers uh, but there are a couple percent that might have been behind the door when the selection was being made and uh, I'll tell you a story I won't mention any names because they may still be around but we had a mission uh, in the southern portion of North Vietnam where we would hit a target and then drop down to highway level and do a road reconnaissance for targets of opportunity because they were moving supplies down, down the coast road. A flight took off, dropped their bombs, dro uh, dropped down to do the road reconnaissance, and afterward, they would head out to sea, go, what they call go feet wet, because then you're away from any shore batteries. And uh, so they turn out to sea, and then the procedure was for, to fly formation and check each other over for uh, any battle damage. So the leader has the wingman take a look at him, and then he goes underneath the wingman. And when he crosses under, he notices that the sidewinder that was mounted on the left-hand side of this guy's airplane is not there. So he calls him on the radio and said, where's the, where's the sidewinder on the port side? And the guy says nonchalantly, oh, it came off when I turned on the master armament switch. Now here's the leader out here, here's the wingman, and a rocket fires off his airplane. He doesn't tell anybody, nor does he turn off the master armament switch. So that's sometimes he is us. I'm going to, uh, I don't talk about this very often, but I was uh, honored to be awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, and I was written up actually by an Army officer in an 01 Bird Dog. Uh, you're probably familiar with that. It's like a Cessna 185, but tandem seating. And uh, I didn't realize this until after the fact but they flew out of a little facility, which was largely a helicopter uh, facility called Marble Mountain, which was on the west side of the Da Nang Airport. And um, they had a short strip there, and they had uh, these L1 bird dogs that the Army flew, but they usually supported Marine operations and had a Marine spotter in the back seat. Well, the day that this happened, which was October of 66, I was assigned uh, hot pad duty. And for us, that was actually sometimes pretty good duty because it was a uh, tractor trailer rig with a big trailer in the back that had its own generator and it was air conditioned. It was the only space I was ever in <laughs> in the name that was air conditioned and had a couple of bunks and a refrigerator uh, for cold water and so forth. And we're standing, what we would do is go out and we would start the airplanes, have the ordnance crew come out and pull all the pins, and then the, airplane, the airplanes would be roped off so no one would come close to them. And uh, they had a starting units plugged in, and uh, in the trailer, if we got scrambled, it had a klaxon horn like a submarine submerging that would go off, wake you up typically, and we would run out to the airplane, and because everything had been set up in advance, we'd been inside, adjusted everything, uh, we were near the end of the runway. We, we could be airborne in less than two minutes. And this particular day, we were assigned uh, one of these bird dogs as a controller. So we headed to the uh, spot mentioned, and 
the weather was not very good. Uh, the ceiling in the area was about 900 feet, and the tops went up in isolated cells up to about 18 or 20,000. Um, when we got on scene, there were eight airplanes already there, four F-100s, I think they were out of Tonsonut in southern South Vietnam, and four A-4s off one of the carriers out in the Gulf. Uh, they could not find a way to get underneath the overcast. And uh, so I'm kind of looking around, making sure we don't run into anybody. And I looked down and there was a little area of clearness through the cloud cover. And I saw the L1 go by. So, excuse me. I didn't knock it off, did I, Bruce? Okay. So I dove through this hole. My wingman, uh, discretion being the better part of valor, decided not to follow me. But I got underneath the uh, overcast, and uh, I was probably 800 feet with a 900-foot ceiling. And I followed the course of the river, because not too many mountain peaks are in the middle of a river. And um, I was able to make out what the uh, Army guy in the L1 was so excited about. He had spotted uh, a group of uh, North Vietnamese regulars and um, porters that were taking supplies from one side of a river to the other and then moving it up a trail. Well, supply to us was uh, weaponry that they're going to use to hurt our troops, and so this was always a high priority with us. He wanted me to strafe, which I did on the first pass, but I had a couple thousand pound bombs under the wing, and when I went to pull up, the airplane buffeted. I mean, it was too big a load to do much maneuvering. So I said, I'm going to go up, come down again, and I'm going to jettison these bombs. And then I can use the, the Zuni's rockets and the uh, 20 millimeter on a low deflection shot underneath the overcast. Now, one of the things I needed to figure out, which I'm not sure I, well, apparently I did a good job. <laughs> but uh, what I did is I pulled up into the overcast, decelerated so that the speed was reducing so that my radius of turn was fairly small, and I did a standard rate turn. You have a little turn and bank indicator that will tell you when you're doing that, three degrees per second. So it'll take you a minute to do a 180 degree turn. Did a 180 degree turn because I wanted it to put me over the river. I knew there weren't any mountains in the river. And uh, came down and I was able to jettison the 2,000-pound bombs. I didn't know until later, and of course I tried, I would like to say I tried to do this, but one of the uh, bombs I jettisoned hit one of the boats that we were after and it sank it. So it was inert, but it, anyway, it worked. Once I got rid of the, the uh, bombs, I came back in and was able to uh, fire a couple of the Zunis and a 20 millimeter and sank a few of the boats and didn't really see a lot because I was passing by pretty fast, but there were a lot of uniformed soldiers on those boats. Um, what had happened, then I got started getting calls from another forward air controller, and he was on the ground a little bit further up off the river, and uh, what had happened is a reconnaissance patrol, which would normally be seven guys, but there were nine in this one because it was, quote, reinforced. So they had two Browning automatic rifles in that squad. They saw these guys going up a trail wearing black pajamas and pointy hat, uh, carrying all these supplies. So they figured it was easy pickings. The, the first rule in reconnaissance is you observe and report back. You don't engage. Well, they did engage. Unfortunately, up ahead of that party was a full company of North Vietnamese regulars, and they turned around then and started closing on the Marines. So these guys are in a world of hurt. Got, got uh, unfriendlies on both sides of them. So the other guy talking to me, the guy on the ground, said, you know, if you can get a couple of those Zunis so we can blow a little area, I've got he said, I think there's a big enough area we can get some helicopters in and get these guys extracted, which to me, you had to do because that's, they weren't going to survive if we left it there. 
So I was able to do that, and uh, I made, I think, uh, four or five passes, pulling up into the clouds, doing my time turn, coming back down, and fortunately always finding a river underneath me uh, and finding the target to, to shoot at. But uh, uh, that's my story. Anyway, uh, very pleased to be working with those guys. Um, I didn't tell you this, but my first, when I was, went to Vietnam, I went on individual orders, and I was assigned to the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force, which was the group that came in uh, mid-1965 and did an amphibious landing, putting 40,000 troops ashore, which was the first big troop buildup in Southeast Asia. And uh, I really have a lot of respect for those guys. Uh, I can recall, uh, I worked in the air office. Uh, the guy who ran it was a bird colonel. His assistant was a lieutenant colonel. There was a major, and there was me, a first lieutenant. So when an outfit requested a forward air controller, uh, guess who volunteered? <laughs> and I, we were in an area somewhat misnamed Happy Valley, and we'd been walking for about six days, and we were pooped, because everything you've got is on your back. And uh, the squad leader was a Lance Corporal, an O3. But he'd been there about eight months, and he had his stuff together. He knew what he was doing. And he, he said, okay, we're gonna bed down here on the reverse slope of this hill for the night, dig a hole. Now, I'm just exhausted. I just want to lay down and everybody else, but hey, he's in charge. Doesn't make any difference what your rank is. He's leading the squad. So we had an entrenching tool, and I don't know if you've experienced this, if you've ever done any yard work where there's just a whole network of roots running underneath it. That's what a jungle floor is like, and they're small and thin, but incredibly strong. It's tough to dig a hole. I finally got a hole deep enough that if I laid down in it, I was below the surface level. And that night, we were mortared, and I was laying in that hole, hearing that shrapnel go over me, and I'm thinking, you know, if that Lance Corporal hadn't made me do this, I probably wouldn't be here. So I have great respect for those guys, following, you know, doing the right thing in the right way for the right reason. This is an accident that happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I'm gonna show it to you twice. One, at full speed, watch the left gear. See how the left gear collapses as he touches down? Now this is black and white, but that's all flame coming out of the back of the airplane. Pilot ejects. He barely gets a partial deployment and hits the water. Other than some abrasions from the uh, parachute stripes, he was okay and picked up. Uh, now I want to show it to you again and stop action. Uh, this is, the carrier is the FDR. This is late 1961. And uh, there were quite a few crusaders down in that area because Fidel Castro was getting Russia to ship him all these surface air missiles, some of which had the capability of striking the continental United States. So there he is touching down, the gear breaks, the stub goes through the main fuel line, which is in the right-hand wheel well, and uh, when the stub hits a metal cross piece on the deck, it catches fire. So here he is going down the deck. If you look closely, you can see him just raising his hands up to the face curtain to eject. Uh, just to explain that uh, in the event you're interested, the primary means of ejection in these airplanes was a face curtain that had two rounded handles over your head. And you would pull that face curtain down and when it reached the limit of its travel, it fired the seat. The reason for that was twofold. One, if you were in a very high airspeed, it gave you some additional protection in front of your face. And secondly, it put you in a pretty good posture because back injuries from ejections were very, very common. There was also an alternate handle, but it was between your legs, so your positioning wasn't quite as good. I took the measurements of the FDR, the carrier. The angled deck 
is 800 feet long on that ship. He's going about 200 feet per second. So from the time he touches down, goes to add power, which is the normal procedure on a touchdown in a jet, he gets no response because all the fluid, fuel is leaking out of the side of his airplane. He realizes he's got a problem, and in the four seconds it takes for him to go this 800 feet, he analyzes the problem, figures out what it is, and decides he needs to eject. And he does successfully. You see him there, canopy behind him. The drug shoot uh, in the next slide, just starting to deploy. The main chute barely deploying before he hits the water. In November of 66, after 14 months there, I was sent home. I got to reunite with Bev, and uh, she came to visit me in Brunswick, Georgia. And I traded for uh, an airplane. It was a little bit slower, but it had a little more room inside. And we rented this airplane from an uh, operator on St. Simon's Island, and we flew to Pensacola, Florida, Bev's hometown, where, and we visited her uh, brother and sister-in-law and their kids. What happened to the F-8? Well, Chance Vought tried the F-8U-3, which is shown here. Now, you'll notice that the F-8U-3 doesn't have any visible ventral fins. It actually had huge ventral fins, but they retracted after, before landing because they were too long they would drag on the ground. What else did the F-8 do? Well, NASA got several of them, and because it was a high-wing airplane, and they could unbolt it from the top and pull the wing off, they did supercritical wing research with the F-8, and here's that in flight. You kind of recognize the shape of the wing that used in a lot of airliners today. I can never figure this out. This is an artist's rendering, and it's called an oblique wing research aircraft. And apparently that wing swung on a center pivot so that one wing was swept aft and the other was swept forward. I never quite figured out the uh, purpose. I don't believe that it was ever built or ever flew, but I thought it was interesting. A couple of other uses. Uh, that's the Philippine Air Force. We uh, gave them some uh, F-80s. And uh, Bev and I had an opportunity to uh, go to Manila, and I was a, uh, I had a client there who, among other things, owned Philippine Airlines. And uh, we went out to a little park at the airport, and they had a crusader there in, in their museum. Uh, the airplane was not real popular with them, though I think it, we were a little bit afraid of it. And then very loyal supporters of uh, the F-8 was the uh, French Navy. Uh, they were supposed to get the Dassault, French-made fighter, the Rafale, to go on their two carriers. The, uh, the French were big supporters, and they flew the airplane through the year 2000 until they were delivered the Rafale, and, uh, and then they retired them. Uh, so what about me? Well, uh, this is a picture of me at an event at the American Legion. Uh, which uh, Bev and I went we were to wear an item of uh, uniform, so I wore my flight jacket. Issued to me in 1963, and uh, the patches were earned later. By the way, I went to see Top Gun Maverick. I actually went twice, because a friend invited us to go a second time. And uh, I wore this jacket so that if people asked me about it, I could say Tom Cruise was my stunt double. <laughs> and this is a family picture. Our son, uh, Jim, uh, Jimmy works in Hong Kong, so he couldn't make the trip. But then Bev, myself, and Christy. Chance Vaught, in their marketing efforts, uh, made up this sticker. Uh, when you're out of F-8s, you're out of fighters. Uh, it was a takeoff on a Schlitz beer commercial that some of you may remember. I only met one guy who actually didn't like flying the airplane. And, uh, but he was very honest about it. This is after I was a civilian for quite some time, and what, I was uh, selling pre-owned business jets. And uh, he worked, he was a corporate pilot for a company, a finance company in Dallas. And uh, so we would negotiate the purchase of new airplanes and, and sell the old ones. I walked by his cubicle 
in the hangar one day and he had one of these stickers up, but the bottom line, the fighters was crossed out and he wrote in the name danger. So when you're out of F-8s, you're out of danger. So he didn't have quite the same love affair I did. Anyway, that is the end of my presentation, folks. Thank you so much for being here. I, I apologize for running over. We will take some uh, questions, okay, Cindy? Okay, great. Yes, sir. Gentleman asked, uh, what about number three in that flight of three? Well, he continued to take off, and when I was going through the tower tapes, I heard a, there was a long silence, the leader taking the gear, long period of silence, and then three's airborne, switching button four. He was <laughs> unaware <laughs> that his leader's in the gear. Number two is ejected off the other runway. <laughs> but I don't want to tell that story because he may still be around. But uh, in any event. Another question. Yes, sir. Doug asked what the, uh, my, uh, we were high school classmates, by the way. Uh, Doug asked what my uh, motivation was to go in the military. I think the idea was planted because I was, uh, I had a couple of uh, part-time jobs, one of which was at the John Tracy Clinic. And John Tracy was the uh, son of the actor Spencer Tracy and his wife Louise. And he was born deaf. And they were doing research on how to communicate and improve quality of life. So I would go in there and be put in a soundproof booth and have electrodes attached to my head and they would send various stimulus in there to, uh, to record the data. The gentleman that ran that clinic was a former Marine helicopter pilot. And I said, you know, I'm kind of running out of ideas and money all at the same time. Uh, I'd, I'd like to consider getting, taking care of my draft obligation. He said, well, why don't you go in the six month reserve in the Marine Corps and he said, at the same time, why don't you apply for flight training? I did, and it's great. I fly in the reserves out of Los Alamitos in a helicopter. So anyway, that's, that was my influence. I did. Uh, <laughs> recruiters are very good salespeople. And the recruiter he sent me to, to see said, well, we understand you want to be in the flight program. We'll get all that going. But in the meantime, you need something to do. So why don't you go down and go through boot camp and you know, you'll learn a lot. Well, I did. Anyway, so I did. But then uh, I went to boot camp in January and I went to Pensacola in August. So, any, anything else? Yes, sir, Santosh. Yes, sir, awesome presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, I think the, the question was about the beginning of, uh, of Top Gun. And to uh, be honest with you, Santosh, the formation of Top Gun was after I was off active duty. However, uh, I would dispute that the F-8 community didn't have a lot to do with it because uh, from the Gulf of Tonkin incident forward, they were pretty active over there. And we had two, maybe somebody could help me with these names. One of them was Tudor T Teague, T-A-G-U-E, and I think the other one was Tom Tinker. But they were a friend of, I think, Steve Folgers, and they came up and gave us a briefing, and it was terrific because in all my air combat maneuvering training, we had never discussed energy management. I mean, when you see an airplane out there and you want to catch them, you know, the, the instinctive reaction is to go as fast as you can. And the only problem is, when you catch up with them, you usually go by them. So what you want to do is take that energy you have and convert it into the vertical by pulling up and then coming back down on the target. So you never destroy any energy you have. That was a big I didn't completely get all that, but you were talking about just impromptu dogfights. Uh, there's a warning area off the coast of California called Whiskey 291, and um, we could climb as high as we liked, and that's where we did all our maneuvering. But we would frequently go out there and look to pick a fight. And so we'd find F-100s out there and uh, F-4s and different areas. So there was quite a bit of air combat maneuvering there. And uh, our technique in those days was try and get the tightest possible turn you can. When actually, when you think about it, if you're involved in chasing someone in a circle, the best way to catch up to him is to cut across the circle, right? You go a shorter distance than he does. And you learn those kind of things. As a matter of fact, toward the end of Top Gun Maverick, 
uh, one of the instructors says, uh, uh, don't think, just do it. And there's kind of truth to that, but you have to know what to do. Uh, you want to do something and you want to do it promptly, but you have to know what to do before you do. Uh, yes, sir. And, and this, did I ever see any mix? And uh, no, I did not. Yes, sir. My question. Oh, the, he asked, what was the useful bomb load? My recollection is on the wind stores was 5,000 pounds. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll wrap up because I've, I've run over and I apologize to you folks. Uh, thank you. Thank you.